In this last video, we're going to look at two uh, kind of tricky aspects of naming cyclics. Uh, first of all, I'm going to, we're going to revisit this molecule, the one that we just did. We've already identified this as a cyclohexane, a six-membered cyclic as being the largest chain. And this guy down here as our methyl substituent. And then up here on top, our complex substituent. And um, I showed you a minute ago that it was commonly named, this guy is commonly named as the isobutyl substituent. Uh, it does have an IUPAC name, which is a little tricky to come by. In the IUPAC name, you will name the substituent kind of as if it was its own molecule. So, because remember, a complex substituent is a substituent with a substituent. And we talked about how this was a three carbon substituent with a methyl group on it. So this substituent is, uh, in terms of its common name, it's a propyl group with a methyl on its carbon number two. So its IUPAC name is 2-methylpropyl. When you are naming a complex substituent using the IUPAC method, you kind of treat it like it's its own molecule. You find its longest carbon chain, you find its substituent, you number and locate its substituent, and there you go. There are two ways that we name complex substituents differently than we would name a, just a regular alkane molecule. Number one, this is named 2-methylpropyl, not 2-methylpropane, because this is still a substituent it still gets the ill ending, just like all of our substituents do. And number two way that it's different is that when you're numbering a complex substituent, you always number starting at the atom that's attached to the parent chain and moving outward. So our objective here is not to put the methyl on the lowest possible number, but to number from the, the parent chain outward, just as convention. So those are the two ways that, that um, an IUPAC complex substituent name is different from just a regular IUPAC molecule's name. Now, when, um, now that we've named this guy, we can go back to the, the normal rules for naming molecules. That right there is tough, so remember, um, we just identified and named the substituents. Our next job is to number the carbon atoms in the parent chain to give them the lowest possible number. So again, with the cyclic, we're going to definitely put one of our substituents onto carbon number one, and the other one would be on carbon number two. So we're back to that same dilemma. Do we call this one and this two, or do we call this one and this two? In the last example, I told you it was all about the alphabet. So because we were choosing to name this guy as isobutyl, which came alphabetically before methyl, this carbon would be number one and this would be number two. Down here, we have different names for our substituents. So it's gonna change the alphabetization and it's also gonna change the way we number it. Methyl comes alphabetically before methylpropyl, which means that this now is carbon number one and this is number two and around the ring we go. So this molecule's name is 1-methyl-2-methylpropyl-cyclohexane. So we've thrown parentheses into the mix complex substituents names are always put into parentheses when we're naming them using the IUPAC method.
if you're going to use the common name of the substituent, like uh, isobutyl, you don't need parentheses. But if you're going to use the IUPAC name of the substituent, you got to put it into parentheses. And that the reason for that is so that we know that this two is pertaining to the complex substituent, and it's not pertaining to a location on the cyclohexane. So it's just to distinguish it. We're still going to use a dash to separate um, the number from the parentheses. Don't use a comma. So we're using a dash to separate numbers from parentheses. That is a tricky name, and it's hard to do, which is why it's really in your best interest to memorize the names of the, of the common names of the complex substituents way easier. And one last funky example for you. Cis guy. Now, we see so many um, cyclohexanes and cyclo... Uh, pentanes and you know large rings with small substituents hanging off of them that after a while we just sort of always get in the habit anytime you see a ring just make that the parent chain but it's not always the parent chain in this particular case the longest chain of carbon atoms is the the branch hanging off of the ring and the ring is a substituent on the the carbon chain it doesn't happen very often, so when it does happen, it tends to trick us because we're going to be inclined to see this as a cyclobutane with a five-membered ring, uh, a five-membered substituent hanging off of it, but that is not IUPAC. So the longest parent chain is this five-membered straight chain. The substituent is this little four-membered ring. If it was a four-carbon substituent, we would call it a butyl. It's a four carbon chain or a four carbon ring substituent, so we would call this cyclobutyl. And then next we're going to number the carbon atoms in our chain to put cyclobutyl on the lowest possible number. So that's going to be from left to right. And put the name together. One cyclobutyl. Pentane. Remember, again, you cannot leave the one off because this is a straight chain. You can't leave the one off of a straight chain. You can only leave the one off when you have a, a ring as your parent chain. One is never implied. On a straight chain. So last thing that I want to leave you with for this nomenclature stuff is just some general guidelines for alphabetization because it can get confusing. When you're alphabetizing you always ignore Greek prefixes which I've already told you. So a uh, tributyl is going to be alphabetized as a B, not a T. For complex substituents, you are always going to ignore the sec and tert prefixes. So that means that tert butyl. is a B, or sec butyl would be a B. You don't ignore the iso prefix. So that means that iso butyl is an I, or isopropyl is an I. That's tricky. The only piece of advice that I can give to you is to notice that when you're not ignoring, no, that's not true. I was just going to say, no, no, there's nothing. doesn't make sense. Somebody explained it to me once. Obviously, it didn't stick into my head. I got nothing to help you with that. Make some flashcards and memorize it.